All right. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to uh, another webinar in the Exceptional Software Strategies Fall Tech Exchange Series. Today, we're going to have the second part of Randy Breeden's Deep Fakes. Uh, and then keep in mind that in a couple of weeks, we will have uh, uh, one of our, our intern manager, JD Brassard, will be giving a presentation on uh, our internships programs over the past summer and next summer. And then two weeks after that, we will have our final series, final webinar in this series for the end of the year. Uh, for and that's me giving one on the state of the art in 3D GIS technologies. All right, welcome everybody, and go ahead, Randy, take it away. Okay, thank you, Bill. Um, this is the second part of the series, and first part we talked about primarily the mechanics and what led us up to the deep fakes, and. The whole series started really with the first bullet up there. When we were take, when I came across the headline, that's what I decided I want to focus on this because the deep fakes are really a hot topic. They're they've got a lot of momentum right now. You see them in the news all over the place, and there's really not a lot of understanding what's behind them. So I wanted to bring that out and help provide an understanding and also provide a way of taking a look at what else they can do because it truly is a phenomenal technology in there. So session one was a satellite view of the history leading up to deep learning. So we went through artificial intelligence, neural networks, machine learning, and deep learning. If you've missed session one, um, we're going to host it before too long. You'll be able to get it through this session without a problem, but you'll, it, it'll help provide you a better understanding of how things progressed over time to get us to where we are. Today, we're going to go over generative adversarial networks or GANs. And, and this is really the heart of what we call deep fakes. And you'll see that it actually covers a very broad topic with a lot of capabilities there. So at the end of last session, I left open a question of what was the first deep fake? And the answer given was War of the World's Broadcast, which was back in October 30th of 1938. It was a radio broadcast. It was advertised. It was... Um, you know, one of the standard shows that was in there, but it was taken by the way that the broadcast was handled. It raised panic throughout the city of New York and made headlines around the world. Some of the headlines you can see up here, um, there were homicides, because of the broadcast, there were suicides, there were calls swamping the police stations. Um, and a lot of it came down to what, you know, a radio broadcast that was really from a book that was seven years, you know, several years earlier, made several years earlier. So taking a look at that, you know, understanding what was it that made it work and, and provided so much panic there. Well, first of all, it was a trust in the medium. It was a trust in the radio. People had been developing the stories behind it, the, the uh, willingness to believe what was on the radio there and the format that was the story was being presented in. So it wasn't the presenters. It wasn't the storytellers, um, you know, the characters that were in the story were totally fictitious. So it wasn't the familiarity of the people in the story, but it was the format of the story, you know, a medium that they were getting, people were getting familiar with. Um, the story also played upon subtle fears that people had about an invasion. Um, you know, this was prior to the World War II they, they, they were concerned about an invading armies coming in and, and uh, 
attacking the country. So, you know, there was there were subtle fears there that they were building upon. And there was also enough of a foundation of a reality because the story started as we're going to we're going to take a uh, go to a reporter off in a farm field up in New York, which everybody said, OK, I know there's a farm field up in New York. And the story began that way. So as it was developing, it caught people up. Now, all they had to do was change channels. They would have found out, you know, oh, well, that's, uh, you know, that's a ballroom station over here. That's a comedy channel over here. They could have easily found out it wasn't real. But once they got caught up on it, they began to um, generate their own fears in this. Keep this in mind as we go through this thing. Uh, when we talk about, you know, what is really a deep fake? What does a deep fake do? What can it do? Because a lot of it really boils down to how are you going to look at it? What are you going to take care of? You know, how, how do you respond to it? Um, for the sci-fi fans, another book uh, by Brandon Sanderson, The Emperor's Soul, is fascinating because it deals with this whole aspect. You know, they have an emperor, they have a forger has to come in, he has to create a deep fake of the emperor within 100 days, or the entire empire will fall into chaos. So the story is really about all the different aspects that this forger goes through to figure out how to create this deep fake um, and, and all, the, all the considerations that are there. And it's the same thing if you're gonna do it today, if you're gonna take a, and, and try to create a deep fake of a person today, what is it you have to really take a look at? Um, a, you know, a question that be, is becoming more and more relevant as we go along. Um, unfortunately, because I'm working remote, the, our link for the videos isn't working very well, but I will post links to some of the videos of some of the, of the famous people that have been generated with the deep fake technology. Uh, taking a look at it, you'll, you'll say, how do I know if it's real or not? So, uh, keep that in mind as we go across. Okay, so the flow of this presentation, I'm gonna take a step back into deep learning for a second. Uh, last presentation, I talked about deep learning. I talked about some of the things it can do. And I gave it about two seconds on the area of authentication and validation. I'm gonna take a step back and go into what it can do, how it can authenticate various things such as paintings, uh, artifacts, writing, and how that can be used to extend far beyond um, looking at other topics such as cybersecurity and so on in there. Then I'm going to take go forward and say, okay, last time we talked about individual networks, we, we talked about all of that as single entities. Now I wanna be able to use multiple of these networks together. And how does that work? What, what, why would I wanna do that? That leads us into the generative adversarial networks or the GAN. I'm gonna take you through the examples of what a GAN can do. Whereas last time it was a lot of, here's the model, here's how it works. This time, I'm gonna do less of that, and I'm gonna show you examples of what it can actually do. These are incredible. And I'm gonna point you to some sites that you can go to and take a look at examples that <laughs> that blow your mind on, the, on what's available, and, and it's growing every day. Then, as, the, uh, <laughs> as was advertised, we'll talk about attack, you know, how, how do you protect yourself 
against GANs? What, what kind of protections available? And then as a final, we'll, we'll talk about some of the other areas where GANs can be used that are far beyond what science fiction has even imagined in there. So before we go to the next slide, um, I will ask, are there any questions? Okay, I'll take that as a no, and we'll go to the next one. So in the previous presentation, I gave you a lot of the mechanics of how things work. Um, a lot of it, you know, you, you, you kind of say, okay, I can see how it works and everything, but it's kind of hard to understand what's really there. You know, um, one of the things I did, I did not touch on last time is why you would really go to an AI. What benefits do you get from an AI? You know, I, I talked about all the things they can do that you can't do otherwise, but those aren't really tangible benefits to work with. So let me show you a real benefit of these things. And this is an AI that's being used for earthquake analysis out in California. Um, this is a visualization of the net, of the network, and if and if you go back to the previous presentation, on the far left hand side, those are the sensor inputs, the seismographs, the temperatures, the altimeters, everything that they have about the earthquakes. Um, it gets processed, and you, you'll see the, the colors of the lines are the directions, the you know, uh, positive, negative. The width of the lines are actually the, when I talked about the, um, the strengths of them, of the features, that's what the width of the lines are about. All the way down to the far right, and the far right is the generative output of the flows of the earth during the earthquake. That whole process, as you can see, there's a lot that goes on. You bring it in, turns it away, in the output, it gives you the output of it. Now, prior to building this model, it would take about 45, 41 hours of running on a 60,000 node cluster to generate the output. After they got this AI model up and running, they can do that same processing on that same cluster in five hours. Massive improvement, massive reduction in time. The other benefit is there, there are four distinct parts of an earthquake that they study. The in-between quakes, the uh, beginning of the quake, the quake itself, and then the end of the quake. Before, they had to run those as four separate processes, each of which was the 40, 41 hours of processing. With this model, they can use that same model. They can actually run all of those with the same model and get the output that they need. Um, massive capabilities that they now have available with AI. So massive savings. And, and just to give you a scale of numbers here, that 41 hours is 2.5 million CPU hours. So that's your desktop running for 2.5 million hours straight on. So, you know, you're talking benefits, there's your benefit right there of where your AIs can really help and it's very tangible. Um, okay. So now taking a look at deep learning as authentication. This is another area that has recently been developed. It's one that as it grows, it's, it's still growing and they're finding interesting capabilities within the AI itself. So what they do is they'll take something like, let's say, uh, pictures, paintings. So they'll take high resolution painting images. They will put it into the AI. The AI will then 
um, using the deep learning techniques we talked about, it will develop its understanding of what is real for those paintings. Now, it, when I say the original paintings, it doesn't have to be a single artist. It could be, they, they can say, hey, this is Michelangelo, this is Van Gogh, this is Picasso, so on. And, and the AI continually develops its understanding of each of those artists and it will develop its own set of detailed understanding of what the artists do. For example, it may be brush strokes. It may be how the brush stroke ends or starts, uh, how they use colors and so on. It picks up its own original, it, it, its own processing for it. Then they can also put in some fake paintings and you know the ones that they've identified as, hey, this is a forged Van Gogh. Um, the AI can then say, okay, I, I can understand the contrasts of it now and puts that in its, in its little brain. Then once they get it trained, they can sit there and take a picture and, or a painting, picture of a painting and say, we don't know, you know what this is, if it's, if it's real or not. Let the AI go through, do its processing and it can come back and say, hey, this is a forged Picasso. Um, the results have been interesting. I, I've seen stories off and on in some cases where in this processing, they've had uh, drawings that they've marked as being, these are forgeries of an artist. They run it through the authentication process and the authenticator comes back and says, no, this is an original. They go back and look at it and actually study the history of it. And they find, yeah, this is an original from a particular period of his time, something that they didn't expect. Other cases, they found originals, what they had marked as originals and everything. And the AIs had come back and said, no, these are forgeries. Um, or this was done by, this wasn't done by the artist. This may have been done by an apprentice or something that was really close to the artist. Uh, you know, so it would pass the pigment tests, it would pass, pass all the physical tests, but the AI could actually detect differences in there to say, no, this wasn't the same guy. This becomes very important when we start moving things forward. This also, the same authentication you can use for not just paintings, you know, they, they can use it for uh, literary works where they can take books, put the books in there by known artists and have the deep learning um, AI then determine other works if they are real from that artist or if they're not by looking at prose, by looking at um, techniques in the words, so on. So it's becoming a technique that's it's becoming very valuable in there. The other place where this fits is in security, cybersecurity. I can use the same technique to determine the authentication of a person, a machine, um, documents in there, contracts, uh, you know, the blockchains, for example. There's a lot of things I can do that I could validate with this that would be very difficult or impossible otherwise. So very useful. And as you'll see in a minute, it, it, the power is incredible behind it. Okay. So now we're taking a look at using multiple neural networks. Um, this is an example that I pulled out to help you you know, it's greatly simplified, but to help you understand how this works together. So think of this as part of the controls for an automated driving system. So I have my cameras, they come in, my first, the first AI engine, its job is to do edge detection. Edge detection means find all the edge of the objects out there where, you know, where does one, one object end? Where does it begin? Um, 
take a look at things like the roads and stuff, signs. So, you know, just, just take a look at your desk and its job is to identify where each of those objects begin and end. That's all it does. It then passes that information on to other engines that have more specific processing that they look at. For example, the sign processing. It takes a look at all those edge connections and says, is there a sign out there that, I'm, that I need to take a look at? Um, so it detects for, you know, do I, do I see a, a stop sign? Do I see a speed limit sign? Do I, see, you know, those are the types of things that it takes a look at. Obstacle processing. Did somebody just throw a ball in the road in front of me? You know, that's pretty high priority. I want to know because I need to, I need to, you know, stop. So I want to give that one high priority, which is one of the reasons why I would put it out separate from the other processing. Road processing. I'm, I'm, you know, am I following the road? What, where are the edges of the road? Are there lines on the road that I'm going to follow? All of that, once those processings are done, now can go into the drive control, which then can determine the priority of, do I need to hit the brakes? Do I need to, you know, slow down, speed up? Do I, you know, turn left, turn right? All of that. So, so you're able to stack each of these AI units together into a uh, priority processing, such as obstacle processing, and specialize them. Now, one of the benefits of things like specializing them, sign processing, for example, the signs here in the US are very different from the signs in say Germany. Well, edge detection is the same, road processing is the same, obstacle processing is the same, but if I'm going to go to Germany, I have to train the AI to handle the German signs differently than I do for the US signs. So breaking them out also has that major advantage there. Um, so at this point, are there any questions? I'm loving it. Okay. So let's let's take a look at the uh, GANs now. This is where things are going to get very interesting. So I started off, you know, I raised the flag about uh, deep fakes. I'm not the first one, of course. In fact, there was a group that raised the flag a while back because they were saying, hey, the technology of this of these uh, GANs is moving so fast that it's becoming almost impossible to determine what's going on. So this is an example. In 2014, that was the state of the art of a GAN. Obviously, you could, you could tell it was a degenerated picture. Not a worry to anybody. Take a look at 2017. That, that you know, you, you would have a hard time determining if that was generated or not. And, and it has gotten better than that. Um, I tried to get some newer examples, but it seems that there's some virus or something that's cut down a lot of research going on this year. So some of the newer ones have, uh, I haven't been able to dig up as much, but let me show you something here. So which of these uh, pictures is of a real person? And I'm gonna pause here for a second. Let you take a close look at them and think about it for a second. And then I'll, I'm going to answer you in a couple sec in a couple of slides later here. So, okay. So let, let's take a look at the GAN technology. How does it work? First thing is I have my authenticator or discriminators, it's called sometimes. Um, there are actually several techniques that can be used for this. I chose this particular example or technique because it's easy to understand and um, 
the example I'm, examples I'm going to give you follow along with it very nicely. So I take the authenticator, I train it with pictures of what I want it to look like. Now, as I mentioned in the, um, set one, I can tell the neural net, hey, I have a threshold of say 20% that, I, that I'm going to use in my training. And that's my threshold that says, I want you to be at least, you know, things to be at least 20% accurate on its, on your output. So you go through, you train it, and I'll sh we'll show you why I, I picked 20% here in a little bit. Um, so I get my, my authenticator trained and ready to go. Now I have a generator. This is another AI engine whose job is to create my images or whatever output that I'm going to send to the authenticator. In this particular case, I'm going to send pictures. So it generates the pictures. Now I can use a blank model um, or it could generate it from truly just random data uh, or a combination in between. So what it does is I'm, I'm getting it primed and telling it, okay, start sending data to the authenticator. So it'll generate an image. Uh, authenticator gets the image and you know, the authenticator says, that's garbage. It does, I don't recognize that. Um, generator says, okay, let me adjust some things. I'll, I'll throw some more random stuff in there. And, and it continues through the cycle until it gets a success. Hey, the authenticator says, I recognize something on this. You know, I, I would pass it, okay? Now you retrain the authenticator and say, Okay, instead of 20%, I want you to go to 40%. So the generator has a baseline now of saying, I know what 20% is. Now, let me see if I can do the same thing at 40%. And it keeps generating until it gets a success. And it keeps going through this cycle until ultimately you get it up to 80, 90% of uh, success in there. Now, what that looks like is you start at the first picture or the top uh, left-hand corner, That's that may be my 20%. As I'm progressing, then you can see where I get the top left or top right, I mean, you know, I'm now at my 90%. That is an incredible image there. Now, as far as my previous question was, which one is my real person? Those three images are what I pulled out. All of them were generated from the same run by the AI. So, okay, let me see what I got here. Okay, so, Da, 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 da. Um, okay. Now I can't. Add. Bill, you, uh, looked like there were some questions there. Yeah, there we got one question right now. Okay. Uh, it's what is an example of positive use of GAN? Because it seems like there are more opportunities to utilize it in a negative way. Um, actually, I will say there are many, many more ways of using it in a positive way. And in fact, almost the rest of my slide deck is in on that area <laughs> alone, uh, because they're, you know, this is powerful technology. What you've you're seeing in the news is this negative aspect of it. Um, but there are some credible things that people have done with the technology in there. And on that note, hello. Okay, there we go. Let's talk about deep painting. So deep painting is where I'm going to have the AI generate a picture for me. You know, up to now, you know, previous examples, I wanted to generate faces and stuff like that. If you take a look at those, it's okay. You know, 
that's pretty impressive. Those could be your fake people on Facebook or Instagram or anything like that. But here's, here's a much more positive and truly incredible example of where they use the same technology to provide some amazing art. So I take a training image and I may look at specific features of that training image. Again, the features are the attributes or the aspects of that image that I want the AI to focus on. So, you know, it could be color, it could be uh, um, our textual aspects, it could be e even hidden aspects that, that I'm not picking up, but I want it to understand in there. And then once I have it trained, I want to give it a base image and say, here's my base image, go generate me a picture. Now, you, there are lots of things you can do with this to get some very interesting pictures out of it. For example, on the training side, you could say, hey, I wanna train, I wanna train this thing, I wanna tra train my generator to draw landscapes. So I give it landscape pictures until it, it's got a good training level that it understands what a landscape picture is. Then I say, okay, I want a landscape of, by the ocean or whatever. It will then generate a picture of that. Um, you know, part part of the fun aspects of this thing. So, now what what can what does that look like? Okay, so I'm going to do a deep painting. Excuse me. I'm going to do a deep painting, and and I'm going to do color as my feature. If you get the chance the deepdreamgenerator.com website. They have, they have a bunch of pictures that were generated by deep learning methods. A and they use all kinds of, of, all kinds of capabilities beyond what I'm gonna show you here. I'm, what I'm showing you is because it's easy to see. They have some phenomenal pictures and I would, you know, you get the chance, I would highly recommend taking a look at them. And I'm not affiliated with them in any way, shape or form. So let's take a look at this. I, I want to take a picture. I, I like this bird. You know, I really like the bird, but my house is really in the colors of the red up above. So, you know, the bird would really stand out, would written really work very well. Well, I can put it in now to a AI, I could say, use the colors of the top picture and generate the picture on the bottom. And I get this. Now, if you take a look at it, you can take a look at things like the um, shadows, how they're all fit in there in place around the eyes, around you know the beaks and all that. Trying to do that with paint would take you, you a, if possible, would take you a very long time. The AI can do it, you know, very quickly. And you, you can do this with all kinds of aspects where you could take a look at it and, and you can say colors, you can say um, textures. And in some, in some of the places that are on that, on that uh, website, you know, they, they take totally artistic abstract pictures and merge them with portraits. And you get, you get some incredible pictures out of them that they work with. So, but this, they, again, this is a really a positive way and a fascinating way that to utilize the technology. So another way that can be taken as good or bad um, I, I, I would look at it as being rather interesting is uh, most people have heard of Vincent van Gogh, artist that died in 1890. But have you seen his movie? You know, it was generated about four years ago. Great movie, you know, it, it's phenomenal. So what they did is they took 
a cartoon movie that they generated with uh, one of the graphics tools. They said, hey, we'll take Vincent Mungo's Starry Night. We'll tell the AI that we want to use that style. So, you know, the colors, the, the um, textures, the paint style, we want the AI to learn all of that and apply it to the movie. Now, what are here are four frames of that movie, but you can see what the AI did is it took the top picture, um, they went through, first of all, a frame by frame processing, which is what the middle section is about. They, part of the problem was with that on a, on a movie um, projection, it really, the way the AI took a look at it on a frame by frame, it caused too much flashing and too much uh, contrast issues with it. So they adjusted the AI and said, okay, we want you to adjust how you're applying this to also take care of temporal issues or movement in the in the video processing and that's what the bottom line is uh you know incredible when you take a look at it how, how do you, how, you know take an artist and your topic and now you can have it painted in your in your gallery in there okay Another place, how about cybersecurity? Hot topic these days. Uh, what you're looking at is actually a variation of one of my con contest projects that I'm using, uh, that I'm developing. It, it, so what I have is I have a network validation AI. I've trained it with firewall settings, network vulnerabilities. So it's able to recognize what these are. It's able to take a look at them and say, okay, I, I know this is a, an attack on these ports. I know what to take a look at. I know this is an out of bounds attack. I can take a look at that. Uh, it can then go back to the generator and say, hey, I caught you. Generator says, fine, try this one. And it keeps going. Now, if, if the network validator says, well, you know, that looked like a good one to me, that would I pass, then it goes to an application validation. So if I have, for example, port 80 open and it looks at it and says, okay, you know, the data you gave me looks okay for port 80, it'll send it back to the application validation. That application validation has now been trained to look at port 80 applications. Uh, it takes a look at what the vulnerabilities are. It takes a look at the web server. It takes a look at a lot of capabilities and does the same thing. So it says, hey, you, you, you tried to give me a bad, bad packet here, <laughs> sends it back to the generator uh, until it happens to get passed. Well, once it's passed, then that's an option to take a look at it and say, is that a real packet or is that garbage um th this way you know you can do it use that data to validate your network security and keep and and build it up one of the advantages of this it turns out is that you can actually the ais can actually detect the validations can actually detect what are called zero day vulnerabilities because as they're developing their intelligence on what to block and how to, how, to, how to handle the information coming across, they're also able to anticipate other vulnerabilities that you haven't specifically told them. There, there are companies that are exploring this. Um, I, I happen to be doing it because it, it's one of the areas of, that I've been studying. I, I also think it's going to be one of the areas that when we take a look at cybersecurity, you're going to see this a lot going forward. And it's a big, you know, it's a big issue. How, how do you go about securing the flow of data, especially when everybody's working from home these days? 
um, when you've got businesses talking to each other, it, it's a big issue. And the GANs, they can help in that aspect, the positive side of it. The negative side of it, that generator also has much more intelligence on being able to break into other network systems. Um, so if I'm going to do a, what's known as a red team attack, that generator is a very effective red team um, tool to use because it can go after and generate attacks much faster and much more efficiently than tools that we, other tools we have today. So, you know, good and bad, uh, like anything else. You know, I, I, the analogy I put on my LinkedIn site was that it's kind of like the splitting of the atom. You know, bad side, we have atom bomb. Good side, we have atomic energy, which powers everything these days. So, okay. So with that, I'm going to step now into looking at combating the GANs. Bad news, there is no silver bullet. Um, they are getting GAN technology that's being generated is so good these days that even the AI authentications can't determine in many cases what's real and what's fake. DARPA has a program out there that they are trying, you know, that they are sponsoring to develop technology to help combat this. But it, it's moving so fast and in so many areas, um, you know, from voice to visual to cyber, that they're really, it, it, you know, there is no silver bullet in saying, hey, I could drop this in and pick it up and that will save me. It, it's moving too fast in there, both on the good and bad side in there. Now, one of the things for yourself you can and you can take a look at this goes back to my first slide with you know uh war of the worlds yeah am i dealing with a scam that's something to always keep in mind because if i'm looking at a facebook entry i'm looking at a linkedin entry i'm looking you know somebody calling me the FTC has these four, three pictures or three items to help you determine if this is real or if this is a scam. So they'll start off with claiming to be someone you know or someplace you know. Um, for example, my mother has three Facebook accounts, only one of which is, is her <laughs> on there. Uh, you know, you have to know who you're dealing with. Sometimes it's hard. Some, you know, sometimes it does take work to figure that out. But just because they're on Facebook, just because they're sending you an email may not be valid. Today on Facebook, you know, recently they just announced that they've disabled thousands of accounts that were bots. Well, what's a bot? The bot is generally a generated portfolio, it may have a picture like I showed you. Um, it has a AI that's generating the text and communicating with you. So it will, you know, if you say, hey, how are you doing? It will give you an answer back. And those are readily available for Google, for uh, Facebook, you know, all of these platforms already have the chat box available for you to plug into your sites. So, you know, you, you got to watch it. Um, generally, the person contacting you, well, there's a problem with your card or there, you know, you've won this prize, you know, something along those lines where they're trying to get you excited. They're trying to get you emotional about it. Um, you know, there's a problem. We, we, we're going to have to shut off your water tomorrow. Um, unless you can pay us today. You know, a lot of pressure to act immediately in there. 
these are all signs you should be able to, you know, stop it and, and say, hold it, hold it. This, this, you know, is this real or not? Look at. These are all also, you know, some of the signs that if you take a look at War of the Worlds, uh, how, how would you apply them? So in high value situations, really like in businesses and stuff, there should be a sec op component that they're taking a look at and utilizing. For except for example, on the second bullet I had in there, the CEO's voice was deep faked. They called one of the accountants and said, hey, I need the money transferred immediately. Okay. The the accountant knew the nun knew the voice and said, okay, yeah, let's go do it. Um, you know, all of the top three of if it's a scam, but as a security operation, you know, take a look at a second verification for those things. If I'm not looking face to face with you and you're wanting me to transfer money, let's put in a second verification, just like the banks have. Okay, you know, let, let's exchange text messages back and forth to verify it's you, something that you have, you know, give me the passcode for this week, something, something that somebody outside of my organization is not going to have readily available. Um, this is becoming much, much more critical. Watermarks, using watermarks. Again, if your CEO or your executive is doing public briefings, you know, that's all material that can be utilized to generate deep fake images of him or her. Use, you know, you can use watermarks to help combat that. So the watermarks can be a visible watermark or a what they call an invisible model watermark in there where you have to really go down below and, and see if it's there. Um, but it allows you to go validate things like videos and stuff later on. Is this a real video or is this a fake one? Because if it's a real video, you should be able to pull out that watermark and show it's there. If it's a fake one, that modern watermark will be obscured. The other one is an audible one. It, it's a watermark on the voice, but it's, it's very subtle or inaudible to the, to the ear. But again, you can pull it out and take a look at it and say, is this real or not? Some additional information. Um, here's your PSA. Is you know consumer.ftc.gov. They have a bunch of stuff on scams. They're sending them out all of the time these days because there are so many going on uh, with defakes, without defakes, all over the place. There. So now take a look at you know where can GANs be used for benefit research. Tremendous capabilities there. Uh, the, you know, I showed a neural network of an earthquake example. One of the advantage again has over most other neural networks is that a GAN takes very little data to be able to generate and, and to provide the a valid image to work with. That's a big big gain if you don't have the data to work with. The research data for the earthquakes, they had years of data to look at. So they were able to generate that. And that, that was not deep learning, that was actually machine learning level. Uh, but if I'm going to take a look at something that I may only have a small amount of data with, then GANs work very well in that area. Example is COVID research. You know, I can use a GAN to help me dig into the data and take a look at what's really important, what's really critical in developing vaccines, developing, um, you know, what, what's really happening 
when the virus attacks. They used AI actually a couple places where they took the health data of the patients that were across you know all these hospitals and everything, analyzed it, and they were able to determine specific aspects that were not previously available or understood of the COVID virus. That helped them then to go back and say, hey, here's how we can treat these, these uh, patients better and better support them. Uh, for example, you know, one of the things that came out of it is respirators don't really help. In fact, they can hurt on there once they, once they were able to see what was going on. Uh, they were able to find medications that had benefits that were already developed to help because they would say, oh, okay, we, we now know where our focus is. We can now put medications to help in that area. On there. Uh, ecology, you know, I gave a cyber example, geology, education, all of these areas are where GANs can provide major benefits going forward. It's one of the most powerful tools I have seen out there. It's being used where, you know, almost any other tool is going to be used. Uh, you know, the frauds is an easy one. People looking for money, figuring out how to get money. And this is a tool that they can use that for. But the same tool has tremendous benefits going forward. And in particularly in like healthcare, I, I posted a uh, article a while back. One of the big benefits I see of this is being able to, think, to do research in things like cancer, where I can sit there and I can have the generator generating different um, medication capabilities and have multiple cells that are being that are responding to these medications but some cancerous some healthy cells and be able to study in rapid time without major you know having, having to go through get patients and all this other stuff but be able to study aspects that would not be available any other way in there just like in the earthquake where the, you know i could turn it around in five days versus a week that type of stuff. So the imagination is wide open on this. Uh, there's lots of capabilities, lots of aspects that are available. And the technology is in its infancy. Where it goes, uh, I'm going to love watching to see where it goes in here. So any questions on that? All right. I think it looks like we have two at the moment. Let's see. The first one is would these tools be available for organizations of all sizes or is it more of a service that is offered through consultants? Seems like there are different levels of capabilities and different levels of expertise needed to use it. Well, um, as, as we talked about in the first, uh, in the first presentation, the capabilities of the technology have gotten to the point where you can do this at home now. Uh, you know, we I pointed out the Intel's neural stick, which by the way, I got yesterday. Um, th that brings the ability to run some of this technology onto your desktop or laptop. So the answer is, does it really take a lot of capabilities? No. In, in fact, when you take a look at the, uh, the website that I told you about, that's somebody doing it as art. You know, that tells you right there, it's not going to be very, you know, it's not, we're not talking about expensive work here anymore. You know, these are artists that they may be having a grant or something, but they're not spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to generate these pictures. So 
I hope that answers the question. It, it, it really is capable with the tools that are available today. It's really at the capability of um, the term kitty scripts that goes back into the cyber world where, you know, you, you could take just about anybody and start them learning this stuff. And they, you know, the tools are there for them to do some really effective work. What's the uh, programming language or the scripting language? I mean, how difficult is that, is that to learn? Uh, well, that goes across <laughs> the, well, let's, let's see, how do I want to answer that? Uh, some of the stuff can be done in Excel. Some of it is, you know, plugins you can put into Excel. Python is truly one of the more popular ones. Uh, R is one of the ones that they're looking at. It's coming up in popularity, but it has a lot of restrictions. Java, C++, you know, all of them, all of these guys have uh, libraries that you can bring in and utilize. Uh, Microsoft actually has a very big library set that you can put on, you know, you can download onto your computer and you can plug in different languages into that um, DLL or, or the, that library. And it will utilize the graphics cards on your computer and everything else transparently. So right now, Python is probably the leader, but it's not limited to that. And, and Python's, uh, as far as things go, pretty easy to learn. Is it still a, a programming thing? Has it advanced at all yet to where you might have a, a what's it called? Um, when you have your- uh, Plug and play. User inter well, your user interface and you can drag and drop components to create a program or capability. Is it, is it still programming though? It's still largely pro programming, but it's, you know, the, the programming aspect of it is, um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. The, you know, one of the AI platforms that I have right now it's the base, the programming language is C, but to program it to actually do face recognition of a, of a video off of a video, provide you the coordinates um, and do, do some other aspect of it is five lines. You know, it, it, that's the complexity of it. You, you're no longer having to actually understand what's even underneath it. All you're doing is saying, here's the video feed, go pull, go pull the face recognition out for it. Give me back, you know, those elements. And then I shove it into the next piece that says, track the movement of it. So it's getting there to a plug and play. Um, there are some people that are, you know, there, there are companies that are looking at it. Not there yet, but it's but it's no longer having to remember these in, incantations, formulas that are, you know, would you'd pull your hair out with. All right. Well, the other uh, it's not really a question; it's a comment. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw an example on a show where a person tried to record a conversation, but the phone didn't record all of it, so the quote unquote tech guy was able to do a deep fake with the piece of voice recorded and the person told him the parts of the conversation she remembered. She then used this deep fake recorded conversation as evidence in a court trial. Um, you know, it, you, you see it in the, you, you see it in the movies. Uh, it takes a little more than that in there, you know, if they were able to go get other voice versions of the person, yeah, they could probably do that. You know, it's, it's getting to that point. Now, again, this is where 
you know, high visibility, you're looking for the watermarks and stuff where you can actually go prove, hey, this didn't come from our conversation because, you know, the watermarks aren't there. Um, but yes, it, it, it is getting pretty scary. And, and you know, this, this is one of the reasons why DARPA wants, you know, is, is sponsoring the research because what if a general is uh, deep faked on orders, you know, and the army has, you know, the military has a lot of verification that goes in place, but there are still places where there are cracks that it can happen. Yeah, so. Um, all right, well, that is uh, all the questions we have and we are past the three o'clock mark. Um, okay. Thank you, thank you, Randy. Uh, it was another very interesting discussion uh, and talk. Uh, the potentials of AI and deep learning and, and all this and deep fakes is, is pretty amazing. It's so, a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. So we'll definitely look forward to any more of these that you're able to put together for us. Okay. Yeah, I, I, it's, uh, you know, I, I, there's a lot in this subject. There's, there's no question about that. Um, you know, we, what we've taken a look at is really just a si satellite overview. And you, you could take any aspect of this and still, you know, go down a level of two and, and it's just incredible what happens and what, what it does. You know, take, take, for example, what does your smart device actually do? Because it's very different from what you think. <laughs> Yeah, well, so. they're listening all the time, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Everybody have a good day.